have um, Vincenza Scapacci. That's a un porco, <laughs> which I don't even say correctly, un porco. Um, it's a program, and it's just, I, you're going to like, really love it. The book is gorgeous, beautifully printed. The pictures are universally interesting for Italians and for immigrants as a culture um, coming to the United States and really having an effect on, on America. And, um, it's the question. How do you accept your Please. The face, yes. You want the face. The pictures are important. First of all, let me see if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. And if my voice fades while I'm talking, wave or something, because uh, you won't be able to pass the test afterwards if you can't hear. <laughs> Okay, my name is uh, Susan uh, Set, is Vincenzo Scarpacci, and uh, I'm an immigration historian, and I have written about Italian immigration to the United States, but different parts of the United States, to Louisiana, to Baltimore, uh, to Walla Walla, Washington. We were all over the United States, and uh, it's the, it's the, uh, Exception to the rule, if you go to almost any part of the United States and don't find an Italian, but even in places where there weren't a lot of Italians, like I live in Eugene, Oregon, a few Italians did come in the 1920s and settled there, very, very few, but for some reason they went wherever there was an opportunity. Okay, this is my ancestry. <clears throat> this is on the cover of my book, which I have over there. Uh, this is my parents' wedding picture, 1928 in Brooklyn. They were married at Our Lady of Loretta Church, which is an Italian national parish. And I think those of you in Boston know what national parishes are. That meant that anyone of Italian heritage could go to that church regardless of which parish uh, they lived in. So there were Polish uh, parishes, there were Italian parishes, Lithuanian parishes across the United States. My father was born in Sicily, in the eastern part, in the province of Messina. Came here when he was two years old, settled in New York. His father was a stonemason. My mom was born in Brooklyn, but her mom and dad were born in Sicily, came from the western part, the province of Trabini, and they came here two years before my mom was born. My grandfather was a bread baker. He makes slitting bread for a bakery, a Italian bakery in Brooklyn. The area where they were married, Our Lady of Loretta, was in a section of Brooklyn that was mostly Italian, right adjacent to a section that was mostly Jewish. And my mom grew up in that area. She was the only Christian in her class. And so she immediately found out what America was like, that America was made up of different people. I grew up in a section, a different section adjacent to, this is called East New York, where uh, our lady Loretta is uh, situated. I grew up in Bedford Stuyvesant, in between where Bedford Stuyvesant ended and East New York began. So Bedford Stuyvesant, even when I grew up, was mostly African American and East New York was mostly Italian-American. And where I lived, there was a mixture. So I grew up in the true America. I had friends who were Irish, Ukrainian, German, uh, of course Italian, uh, Norwegian, African-American, Jewish-American. Uh, and so that was my world. And I consider that to be a privilege because I was aware as a young person that my uh, country and my uh, nationality, my nationality being American, being born here, was made up of people from all parts of the globe. We had one Asian, and that was a Chinese Mandarin, and I thought he was one of the most fascinating people in my neighborhood, 
because he was so different. But I would also go to the Italian butcher and watch when they would cut the beer cutlets so thin you could see through them. I loved watching people work. And I didn't know as a kid I was going to end up to be an immigration historian. But I think that sometimes things that fascinate you when you're young can somehow guide you in your choice of uh, vocations as you progress through life. In fact, when I went to graduate school, I didn't know there was anything called immigration history. But fortunately, there was a man who had just gotten his PhD, and he wrote his dissertation on the Italians in Chicago. And I said, oh, wow, this is a field of study, and oh, you can study about the Italians? And I never looked at it, and that's what I've done all my life. Uh, and I also want to give you, though, a disclaimer. I don't know everything about the Italians in America because you never can. There's always more to learn. And that's one of the fascinating things about the field of immigration and, of course, Italians in America is that I'm always learning new things or learning how to look new ways at things I knew already. So uh, it's an ongoing avocation of mine. and. Uh, I'd like to share a little bit of this with you today. I'm going to show you some themes of the immigration. And please know that my book has many more themes of immigration that are here. And I'm going to show you the Italians in all parts of the United, not all, some parts of the United States. And uh, the library has a copy of my book, which I hope that you read. I have some for sale if you'd like to buy one. I'd be happy to autograph it for you. But please read it regardless of how you get to see it. OK, first, the next slide. And this is my husband whose family comes from Piemonte. And he's going to uh, uh, be the projectionist for me. Italians left Italy for many, many reasons. Most of them left Italy because of economic deprivation that was brought about by a variety of factors. First of all, during the 19th century, the population in Italy doubled. Secondly, there was a number of economic uh, dislocations. The North pretty much industrialized on the back of the South. They raised the taxes in the South to pay for the industrialization of the North. But that didn't mean that the North had it very good across the board because people who moved to factories, they didn't often make uh, good enough wages. Some of them were dislocated off the land because of the factories where they would uh, make textiles at home. Now they were made in factories, make shoes at home. Now they were made in factories. So there was dislocation for that. Even in the North, many people were at in agriculture. And most people did not own their own land. They were sharecroppers. That means that they worked uh, on somebody else's land. They had their own house. They had their little section of land. But they paid for the use of that land, usually in a share of their crops. So they would probably get very little any money. So they had very little money. And they might have a life where they could support themselves, but most of them had no hope for ever owning their own land or improving their lives or the lives of their children. And then there were um, tariff wars between uh, France and Italy, and some, some of the agricultural products were, uh, uh, their prices went way down, and uh, people could not sell their uh, produce to uh, in, in France and other parts of Europe. So there were a variety of reasons why Italians left. Not all of them left because they were starving. Some of them left because they wanted an adventure in a new place. Some of them left because they saw opportunities here and they brought capital with them. Uh, some of them were doctors who came to the United States and usually settled in Italian communities where they became the doctors of the, uh, of the Italian colony. And so it wasn't all the case of that they had to leave uh, because they had no, no choice. But then you must remember that most immigrants, I should say really all immigrants, but I'll say most immigrants, 
are usually the people who have some adventure in their soul. Because I know I would not choose to move to uh, Vietnam or some very different place where I didn't know the culture, I didn't know the language, I didn't know uh, really uh, much about the uh, uh, country geographically and start afresh. But these people, having very little, most of them having very little knowledge of what they were going to encounter, even though they did really know, of course, that they were going to America and they knew something about America. They had heard stories about uh, America. People had come back and told them about America. There were some uh, pamphlets printed in Italian that were distributed in uh, Italy. So they did know something, but they didn't know a lot. And so to have that kind of courage really takes a lot of uh, uh, motivation. And then secondly, know that Every immigrant, regardless of where they come from, regardless of what time they leave their country and come to America, they could have come in uh, 1875, they could come to the United States in 1975. All immigrants have the same pattern. They move from one culture to another culture, usually from one language to another language. Also, they have the adjustment to the, the culture. Also, it depends of uh, depends about uh, depends upon what uh, their country was experiencing when they left, and what the United States was experiencing when they arrived. So that will differ. Immigration immigrants have these things in common, but every group has their own particular way of dealing with these differences. Each culture is different, and each culture will adapt differently from each other. So immigrants are different, and they're alike at, at the same time. The other just generalization is that every immigrant, regardless of where that immigrant comes from, once they step in the United States, they are American. Okay, they are American. It has nothing to do with citizenship. It has nothing to do with the language they speak. They are American because everything that happens to the immigrant happens to America. And everything that happens to America happens to the immigrant. So they are part of the society from the moment that they arrive in America. Okay, here we have a scene uh, that is a universal scene of people leaving to go to a port to disembark for America. And America could have meant South America as well as North America because many Italians went to South America and that immigration started earlier than it did to uh, North America. I mean, started earlier in large numbers than to North America. And some of the people who left, as I said, they did not know much about the place where they were going, except they might have a relative here or have a friend here, uh, but also they were not always, um, uh, they were not always aware of the difference in technology. Like one of the stories in 1915 of a family that moved from uh, Mosquito in Potenza and moved to New York and then from New York to Fresno, California. The uh, story in their family was that they didn't have running water in their, their home in uh, Mosquito, uh, Potenza. But when they got to Naples, they stayed in a hostel overnight and they said the two young kids were you know, like, uh, 12 and 13. They turned the faucet on, the sink on and off all night long because they were fascinated with the fact that here they had running war. So the adventure started before they even left Italy. When they got to the ports, they were always examined for health conditions because in the United States, if you didn't pass certain health requirements, you could be sent back to Italy. So they were examined and then they disembarked to, uh, to Italy. Next step. This is a, 
uh, drawing in a newspaper of 1888. These are a bunch of contract laborers on Mulberry Street, which was a pretty heavily populated Italian section of New York. Now, if some of you saw Martin Scorsese's movie, The Gangs of New York, about the Irish. Okay, well, the Irish were there. This is the five points. The Irish were there, and then the Irish moved out, and the Italians moved there. So these are contract laborers uh, coming to Mulberry Street. They're not staying in Mulberry Street. They're going to the coal mines of Pennsylvania. And why they call them contract laborers, that means either they were contracted in Italy, or as they got off the boat in Ellis Island, there was a guy standing there saying, you want a job? I have a job for you. Many Italians came here because they were contracted. Many people from all over the world came to America at the end of the 19th century because they were contracted. It was illegal then, it's illegal now, but the industrialists always wanted labor and they wanted the cheapest labor they could get and they recruited people from all over the world. So these men, they don't know where they're going. They're going to coal mines in Pennsylvania. They're going to where the person who contracted them has a place uh, to uh, employ them. Next slide. They not only went to coal mines, they went to railroad sites. These men are in Terry, Montana, and this is 1908. And what are they doing? This is a bread oven that they have constructed on the side of the railroad. They probably are living in one of those cars. And they uh, make the bread the way they would have done it in Italy, but instead of using a brick oven that was a peacock shape, shape they make the oven out of clay and stones, and they're baking bread. So they're bringing some of the Italianic town with them to Terry, Montana. Now these men, might have been contracted in Italy, they might have been contracted when they arrived in Boston or New Orleans or uh, Baltimore or New York, wherever they arrived in the United States. But there they are in the middle of nowhere. As far as they're concerned, there are no other Italians in this area. However, they possibly stayed in Montana and perhaps would have worked in a mine in Montana, worked, continued working in railroad areas in Montana. There were smelters for anaconda, anaconda copper in Montana. Some Italians working in Red Falls and other places in Montana. So this way, dispersing immigrants sometimes ended up to be where they settled or near where they settled. But these men possibly could have gone back to Chicago or New York or wherever their families were or their paisanis were after they worked on the railroad. Next slide. People were recruited also because they had skills. And these men are working at the turn of the century, about 1900, 1901, building the Croton Reservoir in Croton on Hudson in New York. This reservoir then and now supplies most of the drinking water for New York. These were stonemasons recruited in Italy and working here. Those big granite blocks they carved from a quarry 17 miles away from the site. They built a railroad to bring the blocks over to the site. These blocks are cut so perfectly that they would be placed one on top of the other that they did not need any mortar or concrete to keep the blocks together. That's called dry masonry. Now that's a skill that the Egyptians used to build the pyramids. The Romans used to build the aqueducts. These, these are skills and talents that come down from the generations. And when this reservoir was built, it was the largest, uh, I don't know if use the right term, the largest hand stone structure in the world at that time. And so Italians were recruited to bring their labor, also to bring their skills. Next slide. This is a scene from Priest River, Idaho, which is the section of Idaho right along the state of Washington border, very, very near to Spokane, Washington. And these men came from Calabria, 
from Grimaldi and Calabria, and they're on Tony Nacarado's front porch in 1914, drinking beer that they have uh, made at home. How did they get to Priest River, Idaho? They were working on the building the Great Northern Railroad, and they heard there was still some land available from land grants. And these men had come from agricultural settings in Italy, and land was something that they yearned for. So they decided to apply for land grant, which meant you got the land for free after you lived on the land for five years. And they stayed there. So how did they get there? They get there because of their work. But they decide to stay there because it's something that is attracting them. But they form their own little Italian community. Even in this little town of Priest River, Idaho, this is called the Italian section in the newspaper where this picture was printed. It said that they, they live in the Italian section. Next slide. Fishing was a was an occupation that many Italians follow. And of course, in the United States, with all of our coast, fishing is an occupation that also was available. And some Italians brought that skill to America, and they settled in areas where fishing was, uh, uh, was possible. So not only the coasts of New England and uh, the South, but like uh, of Louisiana, that's the South, Galveston, Texas, uh, San Francisco. This is a scene from San Francisco in 1935, Fisherman's Wharf. By this time, they had the Monterey Clippers, which were gasoline power. But before that, they had the Felucas, which they used in the Mediterranean. And they brought that, that uh, artistry to America. Right? If these people brought their skill with them, uh, they are uh, fishing, or the people are building the Croton Dam. All right, they are occupied. They are at work. They need shoes. They want pasta. They want imported shoes. So usually when we have these kinds of settlements, that a community formed around them, the people who would supply them with the products that they wanted from Italy. So uh, many of these first uh, incursions would create a community. Of course, in California, you have the other variable of the gold rush of, the, of 1850, which brought people from all over the world. And a lot of Italians, along with people from other parts of the world, came to California to look for gold. <laughs> Once they found out that gold was not available for everybody, they settled there and they created their own communities. The fishermen transported their skills, and next slide, Angelo Bracato and his sons in the 1920s in New Orleans, Louisiana, transplanted their skills. Angelo Bracato was trained in Palermo. He was apprenticed to a master gelato maker, and he spent summers making Graniti and other and gelato and winters making cannoli and other kinds of biscotti. He brought his skills to New Orleans where there was an Italian community as early as the 1850s. In 1850, there were more Italians in New Orleans than any other city in the United States. So as I said, we have a long history of immigration to the United States. So he brought his skills to serve the Italian community in New Orleans. Next slide. I mentioned that many Italians in Italy hungered for land, and since many of them were either agricultural laborers or they were uh, sharecroppers, or even if they lived in a small town, they usually had a little piece of land where they still grew some food for the family, but land was something that most of them wanted but it was very difficult for them to get land here. And most of them came here for one reason. They came here to make money so they could go back home and buy that land, or establish a business, or buy more land, or improve their business, or pay for their sister's dowries. So they came here to earn money. But many of them decided, once they were here, to stay here. And these men are in, uh, 
Hamilton, New Jersey, which is in the southern part of New Jersey, not far from Philadelphia, where a lot of Italians <coughs> began to settle in the, la the last uh, part of the 19th century, the 1890s, 1900s. First, many of the Italians came from Philadelphia during the summer to help harvest the crops. And then they would return to Philadelphia in the wintertime. But then they saw that there was land available and that the, the farmers growing these uh, grow crops could make a living. So some of them bought some of the land that was un, uh, undeveloped. In this part of New Jersey, it's scrub pine. And they had to take all the, the trees out. And it was hard, hard work, but that was a cheaper land. And they developed uh, these row crops. And here they're doing uh, sweet potatoes. But eventually, that became uh, an area for berry cultivation. But they grew a variety of crops. And they would own maybe 20 acres. And that was enough to support the whole family. So here we have people coming from uh, the city, seeing opportunities on the land, and taking the opportunities on the land. And Vineland, New Jersey, is a community right near uh, Hamilton, and that has a similar history. So in a lot of parts of the United States, this process took place. Next And one of the reasons I'm showing you these slides is although you know, because in Massachusetts there were uh, Italians who had small farms, but this is all across the country. And this is a very significant part of the uh, industry of uh, produce production and distribution. The Italians had a very important part in this segment of America's economy that has not been paid adequate attention to by most historians, because most Italians worked in factories, uh, worked in mines, they worked ma mainly in cities, the largest numbers of them settled in cities, and so we don't look at this aspect of the <coughs> experience enough. Okay, here we saw the Italians in Hamilton farming. Well, where did they sell these products? This is uh, Al Alessandro Alfano, who came from Cosenza at age 17, and he married a woman in New York whose family had a, a, a produce, a, a wholesale produce uh, business in the city. And they sold celery, which they had farmers in upstate New York grow celery for them. And they called the uh, celery king of hearts. So they were buying from mainly Italian farmers, wholesaling the product in Manhattan. And he took the company and he expanded it to a point where, like in uh, 1905, he was making 40000 the company was making $40,000 a year. So that was an, a significant improvement. Next slide shows you another aspect of Italians in agriculture. This is a cannery in Richmond, California, which is a little northeast of San Francisco. And this cannery was started by two Italian uh, uh, immigrants from Calabria who came to the area of Gilroy, California in 1905 and started out as sharecroppers and then uh, had an opportunity to buy a small cannery and the whole family worked at the cannery. Finally, they bought that cannery and uh, ultimately they moved to Richmond, California where they built this enormous cannery where most of the employees were Italian, not all of them, and most of them were women. So also the produce uh, raising and distribution became part of the uh, larger industry of all around here uh, food. So canneries, there were fish canneries, there were fruit canneries, there were vegetable canneries, and this occurred across the United States, and in some cases, not in all cases, these were, these were businesses that were developed by Italians. And of course, the customers for this, uh, this, uh, these products were Americans from all different kinds of backgrounds. It didn't hurt that one of the Italians who started this business invented a, uh, a piece of equipment that could pitch 
cherries. And so that patent really uh, financed the business uh, in addition to the sale of the products that they can't. Next slide shows us that even a more uh, famous success story of an Italian immigrant. This is the truck of Giuseppe Di Giorgio, who came from Palermo, where his, his father um, had at Lemon Groves, and, worked, and he had worked at a local Packers cooperative uh, around the turn of the century. And he settled in New York first, and then he moved to Baltimore. And this is a 1905 picture of his truck in Baltimore. With a loan from a Baltimore bank, he began to import oranges and other fruit. And ultimately, he invested in a fruit company and became a larger uh, distributor of fruit and produce in that area. And then he moved his interest also to buying land in Florida and buying land in California. And we know the DiGiorgio company mainly for its prominence in California when it had probably the largest uh, area of raising fruit in the United States, 33 square miles in the San Joaquin Valley. And so here, uh, an agricultural entrepreneur was also a very influential to uh, provide products to the larger American market. But even the small peddler, Italian peddlers across the country, many people will say, well, I remember this man would come around with a uh, horse and wagon, or later with a truck, and sell vegetables. Italians introduced to the American palate uh, items that they didn't know about before. Zucchini, asparagus, artichokes are some of the products that they introduced. Peppers, which didn't come from Italy, they came from America, but when Columbus and the Spanish brought it back to Italy, uh, along with the tomato, the Italians knew what to do with it, and so the Italians used it in their cooking. So they wanted them here, they grew them here, and then, then the peppers went around to all the neighborhoods and sold these products and uh, uh, increased, enhanced the uh, variety in the American diet. Okay, Italians settled all over in America, and we mostly look for areas that that had large concentrations of Italians. And we think that that's all who lived there. The East Harlem in, in Manhattan was the largest Italian community in the United States. This is the North End. This is Salem Street in uh, 1909. And this is an Italian boy who is asking a Jewish family if they want him to start a fire. This is probably a Saturday morning in the North End, where we're first Irish and then Jews and then Italians uh, in sequence lived. And why lighting the fire? Because observant Jews cannot do any work on the Sabbath, and so they could not light the fire. And my, my mom and her siblings did this in Brownsville in Brooklyn, at this, uh, a little bit later, because my mom was born in 1908, uh, they got five cents for lighting the fires. And she said when other kids started, non-Jewish um, non kids, Christian kids started coming, living in the neighborhood, they said my mom was the only Christian in her class, those kids tried to barge into their business. She said, but our customers were very loyal. They said, no, the Girardi kids come and light the fire for us on Saturday. But that was, there was always an interaction, even in solidly Italian neighborhoods, with people coming from other areas. You could go out in the streets, there were some businesses owned by non-Italians. You would go to school, you would have some non-Italians in school. You would go to work, you would work with non-Italians. So there was always an interaction with other groups. And that interaction had an effect both ways for the Italians and for the other Americans. This next scene shows an even more 
uh, exciting interaction of two Italian-American women on a picket line in San Francisco in 1937. Well, one sign is obviously the Chinese because the employees of the Woolworth Newberry stores were on strike. They wanted to raise their wages from $12 an hour or $12 a week or $16 a week, as the sign says in Italian, to a higher amount of money. The sign in Chinese, my friend who is Chinese, says, to me, uh, says we humbly request that you consider our uh, petition. So it's you know, worded a little bit differently than the Italian point. We can't live on 12 to $16 a week for our salary. So these women were picketing on Stockton Street, which is at the entrance to Chinatown, and uh, 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 north, the North Beach area of uh, San Francisco and Chinatown are pretty much uh, contiguous, and it still is uh, today. And so they were picketing, and uh, they, they won their, uh, their uh, strike. But again, here, these women, and these are women who are children of immigrants, who are finding that America is all around them. The next scene is possibly familiar to some of them, some of you. This is Edna St. Vincent Millay picketing for the governor of Massachusetts to pardon Sacco and Vincetti, the two anarchists who were uh, <coughs> tried and convicted of the murder of two men in a robbery of a shoe factory in, uh, uh, in Braintree, right? Mine's going blank. Uh, Massachusetts. And I asked the librarian here, this is Parmenter Street? Is it named after the guy who was shot in the robbery? Yes, this street was named after Harvard. So it's interesting that there was pro and con in people's uh, reactions to that. Many, many people believe that these two men were targeted because they were anarchists. And at that time, in American history, it was right after the, the uh, Russian Revolution, uh, there was some uh, uh, upheaval, there were some terrorist bombings in the United States. Bombs went off in Wall Street. Bombs uh, were sent to uh, the Attorney General of the United States. And so people were very, very uptight about this. And some people felt that, they, that these two men were made scapegoats for that fear, that also concern. And also because they were Italian immigrants, because at the same time, American uh, Congress men were saying, oh, we don't want these people from Southern and Eastern Europe. They're not good for America. In 1924, the Immigration Quota Acts were passed so that very few people from Southern and Eastern Europe could come to the United States, but lots of people <coughs> from Ireland and Norway could come to the United States. They gave them high quotas. They gave the people from Southern and Eastern Europe, Poles and Greeks and Italians, very low quotes. So this is the same thing that's operating at the time when Sacco and Seti are being tried, convicted, and then the series of seven years of appeals to get the case reopened and also to have them pardoned. And Edna St. Vincent Millay is an artist. She's a poet. Many Americans of non-Italian origin saw that for them, these men were made the scapegoats of a system that wanted to put the uh, blame of the issues that were plaguing America, because in the 1920s, the economy wasn't good. A lot of people uh, were unemployed, or they were partly employed. They would make about $500 a year for a family of four, and that was not enough to supply the family for all of the uh, expenses they need for the year. So this was a hard time in America, and these men were being tried and convicted. Regardless of what people's views are about anarchism, and anarchists believe that you don't need a government, that if people just get together, and if you can make shoes, you make shoes, if I can grow food, I'll grow food, 
and somehow we all figure out how we get things um, supplied to each other. Uh, so, but even if you're not pro-anarchist, even if you're not pro-syndicalist, which is the policy that believes that all you need is the um, producers, the people who make things to get together. So it's kind of like a union, uh, but it's all people working, get together. They can figure out how to exchange these things. M most everybody believes the trial is unfair because in our system, you have to prove without a shadow of a doubt that the people who are being prosecuted have committed the crime. And even if they committed the crime, if you don't produce the evidence, they go free. And most people who look at it, this is taught in law schools, this is always a case that they look at in law schools, that the evidence was not uh, complete, uh, that evidence probably was tampered with. So given the system, they should not have been convicted of the crime. But it was a big cause celebrity, and not just in the United States, all over the world there were demonstrations in Paris, in Tokyo, in Buenos Aires, uh, all over the world. And people, as I said, not just Italians, were very much uh, uh, upset and angry with the system. And it's interesting to know that today, members of the European Union cannot have capital punishment in their systems. And Sacco Vincetti has been used in Italy many, many times to push for the end of capital punishment. And Italy did uh, uh, disband uh, capital punishment. So it has you know, it's this whole idea that these people, these men, were tried unfairly and they were, they were uh, executed because of uh, this uh, unfair trial. Okay, next slide. As you said, there was two sides of this story. And this is a scene from Waterbury, Connecticut in 1922. And this is a doctor in the uh, far right, Dr. Dr. Anthony uh, Vestula, who is the founder of UNICO, the Italian service organization that was founded in the 1920s for two reasons. The Eagles, the Elks, all the fraternal organizations in the United States, most of them did not admit Italians. And these were a group of Italians, mainly businessmen, he's a doctor, a medical doctor, who want to provide things for their for the community. But they were not given the opportunity. So that was one of the reasons that Unico was founded. The other reason was because of things like the Sapa Benseni trial that and some people say, oh, look at those Italian people. They're anarchists, they're bomb friends. They're not really good to have citizens of the United States. And so they wanted also to show, uh, from their point of view, that there was another side to Italians, uh, Italian immigrants, and what they could offer to America. But things change. And after the 1920s, uh, Italian communities uh, changed. You were two slides too much. Okay, this is uh, Ellis Island, a view from Ellis Island. This is probably like 1941. And this was uh, a case of World War II where Italy is our enemy. And all Italian citizens living in the United States were enemy aliens, like the Germans and like the Japanese. Unlike the Japanese, who were put into camps, the Italians and the Germans were, well, were not put into camps, but they were under scrutiny. And this picture I use to show one very famous Italian-American, Ezio Pinza, who was the uh, bass singer at the Metropolitan Opera of great acclaim. He was arrested by the FBI, brought into uh, the headquarters, not told why he was arrested, not given access to lawyers. He was put in Ellis Island. There were big headlines in the papers that uh, uh, El, El Duce's pal arrested. People say even after the story that maybe somebody who was a little jealous of his success 
suggested that he had some uh, leanings towards fascism. The guy had just uh, put in his first papers for his American citizenship, but he was one of the Italians who Italians to were picked up and brought in for questioning. Uh, in California, 10,000 Italians had a move from military district number one into the interior uh, because they, DeWitt, who was a little bit extreme in his uh, ideas of uh, what should be done during the time of war, he was probably the most important person to uh, incarcerate the Japanese Americans, even those who were born here. But the Italian uh, enemy aliens had to move from the military district only for six months because they had to move in March. In October of 1942, the Attorney General says, oh, Italians are not enemy aliens anymore. He made this declaration on Columbus Day. Why? My take on it is that Italians were the largest ethnic group in the United States in 1940. Most of them voted. People who had become citizens voted. Their children could vote. It was a big voting block. And my take on it is that the elections were coming up in 1942, the body elections, and Roosevelt wanted to have Italian support. It was in 1940 when Mussolini invaded France. Roosevelt said, oh, this is a dagger in the back of the French. And a lot of Italians got you know, angry at Roosevelt for making that comment. And in the 1940 elections, there was a little leakage of Italian-American support of the uh, Democratic candidates. But regardless of that, there was this hysteria, again, when we have a war situation and we have feelings of insecurity and uh, fear that we sometimes look for a scapegoat and this could uh, occur. Next slide. This, on the other hand, World War II, people say that probably 12% of the armed forces were of Italian heritage. And that would be the largest ethnic group in the armed forces at that time. And this is a blessing of a service flag for the young men of the 14th Ward of Newark, New Jersey, sending them off to fight. Next slide. All right, the end of Italian communities. This is your North End in about 19, uh, probably late, late 50s, probably 58, 59, when they're building the arterial highway, which was supposed to be the future of uh, transportation in America. It cut into the North End of Boston. This happened across the country, around the uh, area of uh, the University of Illinois Circle Campus in Chicago. That area was uh, demolished for supposedly in improvements to the, for the community. Portland, Oregon, many, many cities undergoing urban renewal. These sections were considered to be blighted and they were considered to be substandard and progress was our most important product, but it did cut into what had been uh, a very uh, heavily uh, settled Italian enclave. Another picture, a dramatic example of that this is Butte, Montana in 1960, when the Anaconda Mine decided that they wanted to go to open pit mining. And they owned the land underneath all the houses. There were Italians working there, Croatians working there, Pauls working there, hundreds of them. They bought their houses and told them they had to move. And they just open the land in the pit. And this is uh, a church that was on the borderline of what was the Italian and Croatian section of Butte, Montana. They moved the Italian church to another section of town. It's now the museum, the mining museum of the West. But this was the uh, church that had both uh, Italian and Croatian parishioners. They buried it alive. So the dramatic way of uh, the industrial segment 
doing what they felt was important to their uh, business to have open pit mining, which made it easier for them to extract the uh, minerals from the earth. So for many, many reasons, the Italian communities across the country were impacted by changes. And of course, nothing stays the same. People uh, progress, the children grow up, they have opportunities elsewhere, they move to different places, and so on. And so people move out of the Italian enclaves. They also have internal migration. How many of you have relatives or friends who live in Florida, who live in Arizona? The movement of people to different parts of the country for various reasons continues to disperse the population. So what do we have to remind us of our Italian American heritage? And this is one of the questions that I try to uh, address in the book. I don't have any answers for it, but one of the ways that we continue our Italian American heritage is to pass down the traditional recipes that we uh, have from our ancestors who came from Italy to America. And this is a scene in Columbus, Ohio, in 1981, where Rita Villani is teaching her uh, granddaughter how to make uh, cavoletti, which is a dish that came from her area of Italy, which is Emilia Romana. And it's a little hats like the Napoleon hats that they fill with a mixture of uh, meat and cheese and they make them for uh, holidays. And how this is still part of our culture. Uh, this little girl is, of course, now a grown-up woman. And her daughter went to school, was in grade school, and it was at Thanksgiving time. And the teacher said to the kids, what are you having for Thanksgiving? So the little girl said, cavaletti. So when Christine, this is Christine, who's now an executive mother. When she came to pick up her little girl, the teacher said, well, I didn't understand what she meant by we have cavaletti for Thanksgiving. She said, well, that's the first course. Of course, we have turkey like everybody else. <laughs> but just how, you know, uh, like for us, we always had pasta as a course at Thanksgiving. You could not have a holiday without having pasta for Christmas, for Thanksgiving, for Easter. It was not a holiday without pasta. So this tradition, and this is one of the ways that we continue our heritage. Next picture. Another way is by our celebrations. We have festas. Uh, here you have in the North End a lot of religious festas. Uh, here is a Columbus Day parade in uh, New York City where the Columbia Association is up with the fire department, which still has a predominant number of people in the fire department who are of Italian heritage. So a parade is another public demonstration of our heritage. Next slide. Another way we connect with our heritage is by going to Italy, either as a tourist or to visit uh, uh, relatives or uh, friends that we have contact with in Italy. And this is a case of one Italian American who's meeting his first cousin for the first time. He didn't know he had relatives in Italy because a lot of people did not keep in contact for one reason or another. And there's a little business this Italian uh, immigrant in Ohio runs. He takes Italians to Italy, shows them what he calls the best of Italy. So they go to Florence, they go to Rome, they go to Assisi. And then he takes them to the little towns where their families come from, mainly in the south of Italy, because this uh, guy works in uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. And he looks in the telephone directories, looks up the names, and sees if there's any relatives. And often he brings together Italian Americans and their relatives in Italy. But I can tell you that even if you don't know anybody in the town where your ancestors came from, and that could be your ancestors in Italy or your ancestors in Oslo, Norway, going to that place where they came from and seeing what it looks like and knowing this was the world they left and came to Boston or came to uh, Priest River, Idaho. And this is what they, where they settled. So how was it the same or how was it different? 
you have a, a sense of appreciation for them and understanding of your own heritage. And here is a more official way of connecting with our heritage. And this is a group of young people who are sponsored by the Sons of Italy. And they are in the Library of Congress, the Great Hall of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. The Library of Congress is the icon of American learning and education. Thomas Jefferson sold his books to Congress to start the new Library of Congress after the British had burned down Washington in 1813. Right, if you look at the carvings of the marble staircase, that's Italianate design. Now, I don't know if the Italian uh, carver, sculptor, did that. But regardless, it is influenced by Italian design. The loggia, that's Italianate design. And these young people are probably going to go over to the Capitol and they're look at the Bermini frescoes on the dome of the Capitol. And throughout Washington, you see there's lots of sculpture that was commissioned by President of the United States to enhance, unify, civilize the new country of America. So they are going to get a little taste of Italian uh, influence on America. But, <coughs> next slide, I would prefer that they would know that the very building they're in, the Library of Congress, which was built in 1892, was built by many people, including Italians. These are Italian stonemasons putting the keystone arch into the clear story arch of the Library of Congress. And so that this icon of American learning, from its foundation, the sweat and labor of many people, including Italians and, and other, uh, other Americans, have constructed this edifice of learning in America. And that, to me, is the true story of the journey of the Italians in America. And I just thank you for coming today. And I would love you to give us your questions or give me information if things have uh, uh, struck your uh, thoughts while I was talking to you. I would really love you to share it with me. So.